This video assumes that you've already made it through all the atmospheric and climate related videos and have a grasp of the atmospheric convection cells from the deep dive on global winds. That said, in this video I want to answer the question, why are certain biomes, or even specific ecosystems, located where they are? A biome is a broad region defined by its climate, the pattern of temperature and precipitation seen in an area, and the plants and animals adapted to that climate. The location of a biome is primarily influenced by where certain climates form as a result of sunlight exposure, which is actually identical to saying distance from the equator or latitude. Elevation also plays a role, as the higher an elevation, the less dense the air tends to be, resulting in cooler temperatures. And these two things, combined, explain a lot of what we see, but there are some smaller regional impacts that can influence climate. Other factors that can influence the climate include the location relative to a large mountain range, the direction of the prevailing wind patterns, how close this area is to a large body of water like a lake or better yet the ocean, the direction and temperature of the nearest ocean current, and then there is one extra factor that I'm going to add in and that's El Nino, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a unique periodic oscillation of climate conditions seen in the Southern Pacific. Let's get started with the most influential aspect of determining climate, which is going to be latitude, or distance from the equator. Because the Earth is spherical, it's subdivided into parallel lines starting from the equator, which is the center, and set at zero degrees. Most commonly, we see delineations of 10 degrees, so if you're 30 degrees north, you're along the 30th parallel in the northern hemisphere. If you're 50 degrees south, you're along the 50th parallel in the southern hemisphere. Because the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere are mirrored, the same general climate patterns apply to both halves. The reason why latitude plays such a big role in climate is because of sun exposure and the resulting global convection cycles due to the rising of warm air and the falling of cooler air. And again, if you're unfamiliar with the global circulation cells, I've linked my deep dive on atmospheric circulation in the description. The equator sees the most direct sun exposure throughout the year, so it's the area where the most heat is produced. Light energy hits the ground. The kinetic energy of light is absorbed by the ground and radiated to the air as heat. As a result, this is the area where the air is warmest and where you'll see the highest rates of water evaporation as well. As air is warmed, the particles that compose the air, right, the nitrogen, oxygen, CO2, argon, they have more kinetic energy and are now moving farther away from each other faster. This results in warm air being less dense, right? There is more space between air molecules at any given time. This extra space between molecules also makes a lot of room for water vapor. This is why warm air can contain more water vapor than cold air. Now, as a result of the lowered overall density of the warmed air, the volume of this air pocket expands and warm air begins to rise. So what we've got going on now is a lot of air rising on this updraft, and with it is a bunch of water vapor. As this air continues to rise, it is now farther away from the source of heat, the ground, so it begins to cool off. As the air cools down, the density of air increases because the particles just aren't moving away from each other as quickly. And when the air cools down, the water vapor is quite literally squeezed out of the air, which causes rain. Let's look at this phenomena from a global perspective. The Hadley cells updraft is located at the equator, and here you have air rising as powered by the really high insulation. As the air increases in elevation and gets farther away from the ground, it cools off and the water vapor condenses out as rain. This air mass travels along the upper winds of the Hadley cell and continues to lose moisture along the way. By the time the air mass makes its way to the 30 degree mark, remember the location of the downdraft of the Hadley cell, all that moisture has already been squeezed out. And this is what results in two easily discernible climates very rainy along the equator, and then very dry along the 30 degree parallels. This is clear when you look at satellite images of the Earth, right? It's green or perpetually cloudy along the equator where the rainforests are, 
and then it's super clear further north and south and you can even see the color here is definitively sand. It's the desert. The next big updraft system is seen at around the 60 degree mark where the feral cell has its updraft. Regions along this parallel and a few degrees north and south see rain as a result, but because it's farther from the equator and cooler, you just don't see as much rain as you would at the equator because there's just less water evaporating. Notice also the extreme difference between winter and summer temperatures on my climatogram. The seasonality seen along the 60th parallel is here as a result of varying sun exposure throughout the year because of Earth's tilt. The Earth orbits the Sun, but the Earth itself is on a 24 degree axis. This results the hemispheres facing the Sun for half the year each. During the summer months, the northern hemisphere is where you tend to see an increase in precipitation and temperature because that side is facing the Sun, which results in a more direct angle of sunlight. This increased light exposure allows more water to evaporate, which leads to more rain. During the winter months in the Northern Hemisphere, you tend to see a decrease in precipitation, especially in the farther latitudes because there's just not enough energy available to evaporate water. As you move further south from the 60 degree latitudes where grasslands and deciduous forests tend to be closer to 40 degrees, you'll notice the climate pattern has precipitation being less variable. Rain does tend to increase during the warmer months, but it's not quite as dry here during the months outside of summer, which is, again, due to changing amounts of sun exposure. During the winter, as the 40th parallel sees less direct sun exposure, there just isn't quite enough energy to evaporate water, resulting in slightly drier conditions. As you move towards spring and summer, more direct insulation spurs more rain. The most stark seasonal differences are seen just north and south of the equator where the savannas are located. Now, the exact equatorial regions themselves, right along the zero degree line, are pretty much always going to be warm and rainy with very little exception due to Hadley cells updraft being pretty much always situated right near the equator. But the Hadley cell does change seasonally and this drastically changes conditions for biomes situated closer to the 10 degree latitude line, such as savannas. Look at that stark difference in precipitation for April and May. Another thing we need to pay attention to in this climatogram is the temperature curve. Notice that it dips in June and July. This gives us the hint that this is an ecosystem in the southern hemisphere. But let's aim to explain why there's such a stark difference in precipitation along the 10 degree latitude lines. Now, these graphs show a lot of data, but let's just simplify it. First, let's notice the x-axis. This shows latitude, and zero is going to be the equator. As we move to the right, we're going to the northern latitudes, and as we move to the left, we're going towards southern latitudes. What we're seeing here is the stream function of the atmospheric cells, which is a function of air movement. So what these graphs are trying to show you is the movement of air of the different atmospheric cells. The cells at the equator are, of course, the northern and southern Hadley. While this diagram does include the feral cells, we're just going to ignore them because they're irrelevant for savannas. While this isn't exactly how these sorts of graphs work and what stream flow shows specifically, I'm going to take some liberties and draw where the updrafts and downdrafts of these cells would be along the x-axis that shows latitude. Let's go ahead and see how these graphs change during each season. During the spring, we see that the Hadley cell takes the form of two relatively weaker cells in both hemispheres, and they share a common region of rising air near the equator. Notice how during the spring months of March and April, the convergence of the northern and southern Hadley cell is just south of the equator? This is when you'll see the greatest rainfall along the 10 degree southern latitude because you are directly underneath the updraft of the southern Hadley cell. Notice how this condition lines up with the period with the most rain in our southern savanna. During the summer months, June, July, and August, the Hadley cell instead somewhat converges into a single large cell where the southern Hadley cell expands greatly and becomes the dominant circulation pattern at the equator. Just look at the difference in the positions of these cells from March into August. During the summer, the updraft of the southern Hadley cell 
has actually encroached into the northern hemisphere. Now, because the southern Hadley cell has shifted this far north, the entire cell has, which means the downdraft of the cell has also moved farther north. We can see this coincides with the driest months in our savanna in the southern hemisphere. During the winter months of December, January, and February, we see the Hadley cell transition to a single cell, but this time it's the northern Hadley cell that becomes the dominant circulation pattern. This pushes the southern Hadley cell farther south. Now you may notice our savanna, located around 10 degrees south, is now part of the updraft system of the southern Hadley cell. And we do see a slight increase in rain during the winter months here, but the southern Hadley cell is now a little bit weaker during these months, so it's only a marginal increase in precipitation. Now let's take a look at all the seasons, starting with the spring, to see this shifting of the Hadley cells. We see in the spring and fall the Hadley cell is two distinct cells with a shared updraft right near the equator. In the summer, the southern Hadley cell expands and becomes the dominant convection cycle near the equator. And during the winter, the northern Hadley cell expands and becomes the dominant convection cycle near the equator. Something to pay attention to, however, is when these seasonal changes occur as they are flipped in the northern and southern hemisphere. Here are two climatograms of savannas in Africa, north and south of the equator. Notice how the timing of seasons are flipped. Make sure when you're discussing climate, you're looking for patterns of temperature and precipitation changes, not just the months themselves. That's pretty much everything there is to know about latitude. Let's switch gears to elevation. Now, this is simple. The higher the elevation, the cooler it is. So let's go to South America, where the rainforest is, and go just west of it. Here, despite being along the equator, we don't see a rainforest. We see a tundra. This is because we're at the Andes Mountains, and we're really high up. Up here, the average temperature is only just barely above freezing, and since colder air can't hold as much moisture, it's pretty cold and dry up here. But what if you're not on the mountain? Maybe you're standing on either side of it. Well, that means you can have a regional difference in climate as well. Let's stay in South America for now. Notice the stark difference here between the west side of the Andes and the eastern side of the Andes? You see, mountains have two sides. The windward side, or the side facing the direction of wind, and the leeward side, which is opposite of that. Here along the equator, the direction of the prevailing wind patterns are going to be the tropical easterlies, so the wind is coming in from the east. Well, east of the Andes, you have an entire rainforest there, so plenty of moisture in the air due to all that evapotranspiration. And when this air mass, moved by the wind, slams into the mountains, it has nowhere to go but up. As the air travels up the mountains, it cools off and loses moisture, so all that water rains out. By the time the air mass has made it to the other side of the mountains, all that water vapor would have condensed out and you're left with totally dry air. This is the rain shadow effect, right? A shadow is when something blocks the light, right? Well, a rain shadow is when something blocks the rain. And the Andes are doing exactly that. This results in a desert on the leeward side of the mountains. Your proximity to a large body of water also has a large influence on climate. Water has a much higher heat capacity than air, and what that means is it takes more energy to increase the temperature of water than it does to increase the temperature of air. Water, however, also takes much longer to cool off. Water will absorb heat energy until it reaches the same temperature of the air around it. Water will also release heat energy until it reaches an equilibrium with the air around it. This is why temperatures of land near a body of water are more moderate. The high heat capacity of water results in coastal areas having a much narrower range of daily and seasonal temperatures. But there is more to it. Water and the heat energy it circulates is always moving. And these global wind patterns really do set up our ocean circulation. As the wind blows, it drags along, especially the top layer of water with it. If you look at a map of the prevailing global winds and ocean currents, you will notice something. Yeah, the ocean currents move with the global winds. The ocean currents are an important part of the entire Earth system as they distribute heat from the warmer regions 
over to farther latitudes. As a result of this heat distribution, the global ocean currents also impact climate, especially along coastal regions. Notice how these ocean currents flow. Some ocean currents move away from the equator, and water coming from the equator has absorbed a bunch of heat energy there and is now losing it to the air around it. And some ocean currents come from the polar regions where that water has lost a whole bunch of its heat energy. Warm ocean currents tend to release some heat energy into the air, and cooler ocean currents tend to absorb some heat energy from the air. In addition, colder water also evaporates a little bit slower. So in addition to the temperature changes, a cooler ocean current doesn't contribute as much water vapor into the air as a warm ocean current would. Let's look at two areas affected by this. Let's go to the eastern coast of the United States, right around the 32 degree mark, where South Carolina is located. Here along the coast, we see a relatively rainy climate that gets 122 centimeters of rain per year. Now we're at 30 degrees latitude. Here, we'd usually be expecting a desert-like climate because of the downdraft of the Hadley cell, but no, we have plenty of rain year round. This warm ocean current is coming up from the south and consistently contributing some water vapor into the air. Now, if we follow the same line of latitude over to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, to Morocco, we see a much drier climate. The cool ocean current here isn't contributing much water vapor into the air, so we end up with a more arid climate. This last climate factor is unique, and it's a climate impact that is regional and found only in the southern Pacific Ocean. The normal weather patterns here, based on latitude, ocean currents, direction of wind, all of it, result in a dry climate along the coast of South America and a rainy climate along the coast of Southeast Asia and Australia. During normal conditions in the Pacific Ocean, the equatorial easterlies blow away from South America and towards Asia. This causes warm water to pool closer to the western side of the Pacific Ocean, which results in generally warmer and rainier conditions. During an El Nino event, in the southern Pacific Ocean, the ocean current and prevailing winds slow down. Now, the exact cause of why this happens is still not fully understood, but this does tend to happen every four years or so. These change conditions last for a few months before returning to the normal conditions. Now, this changes where the warm water pools, resulting in much drier conditions near the Australian and Southeast Asian side of the Pacific. During particularly strong El Nino events, the winds actually change the direction. The usual easterly wind now blows as westerlies. This causes warm water to pool much closer to South America, which contributes to additional moisture. This results in more rain. Not to mention, if the winds are now westerlies, you're now on the windward side, at least momentarily of the Andes, which might also contribute to some additional rainfall. Meanwhile, on the western side of the Pacific Ocean, a region that traditionally gets more rain, well, because that warm water is no longer being pushed here by the wind, for a few months, the climate tends to become significantly drier. Let's remember that this is a periodic pattern, so it is part of the climate here, usually much to the chagrin of people on either side of the Pacific Ocean. That is everything you can possibly need to know for AP Environmental Science about geography and its impacts on climate. But for now, go explore the outside.